Okay, I'm gonna do that. Hi guys. Well, it is a dreary, snowy winter day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this slow Saturday afternoon. It is Saturday afternoon in the collapse, and that would be January 7th, 2023. And so I am thrilled to announce we're going to share a brand new voice on Collapse Chronicles, a voice I have never heard before in my life, and I'm thrilled to say this is, this uh, fellow is the nephew of my good buddy Elliot Jacobson, uh, and this is a long email that uh, he shared with his uncle Elliot, and they have kindly given me the permission to to read this. This is from a fellow named Reuben Schar, S-C-H-A-E-R. Uh, never met the man. Uh, I think that Reuben is late 30s. Uh, he mentions he has kids in here. Not sure how many kids or how old they are. But anyway, this is... Uh, Reuben, what uh, Reuben Shar had to say to his uh, uncle Elliot after watching uh, Elliot's interview and my interview on Soft White Underbelly. Uh, these were the thoughts that Reuben wanted to share, and I thought uh, they were worth sharing with the rest of you folks. So thank you, Reuben, for giving me the opportunity to read this. <clears throat> My seminal experience that pushed me squarely into the Doomer camp about a decade ago was a video lecture by, well, the late Professor Albert A. Bartlett called Arithmetic population and energy, and I will put the, uh, the link to that video, and Albert Bartlett, uh, one, of, one of the great doomers. <clears throat> so we can thank Albert Bartlett for sending uh, Reuben uh, into the, uh, <laughs> into the doomosphere. <clears throat> What you said in the interview, I'm assuming he's talking about his interview, Elliot Jacobson's interview with Mark on Soft White Underbelly, or it might have been talking about the interview with me. What you said in the interview about the inevitability of this situation we're in being doomed the moment humans began using fossil fuels is a really profound statement because it illustrates the dichotomy of fault and cause. <clears throat> yes, humans are the dominant cause of ecological and environmental destruction today, but it's not our fault. That's not an excuse. It is a fact. Our brains and bodies developed through evolutionary processes spanning millions of years, adapting us to a world in which we only had access to diluted solar energy in the form of growing plants for food, feed, and fuel, harnessing wind and water for mechanical energy, which put a hard limit on productivity, population growth, and the environmental impact any individual human might have. There was no evolutionary pressure to develop an innate ability to responsibly wield the power that comes with access to unlimited energy. And there is no way to sustainably operate a post-industrial economy 
if all the human decision makers are running a firmware that is at least 200,000 years old, built for a world with one fiftieth to one tenth the population and half the life expectancy and living in groups of less than 150 people, the infinite growth paradigm is implicit to that evolutionary endowment. Our survival was under constant threat and having as many children as possible working as hard as possible to feed ourselves and to build generational assets and infrastructure was the only way for humans to have a chance at surviving at all. In essence, we always had an infinite growth mindset, but were spared broad destructive consequences due to external limiting factors, sometimes better known as the limits to growth, you know, which we're coming up against again now. <clears throat> I think it's really important to recognize the distinction between fault and cause because there is a sense of collective guilt about what we have caused making us defensive and I think it is getting in the way of making meaningful changes be it on an individual or societal level however late it might be for that. I have two potential mechanisms for improving things in the long term. By improving, I don't mean avoiding or reversing the ecological destruction and climate change, but fundamentally improving our ability to function sustainably as a species that wields unlimited energy. Number one, institutional systems. Unlike 100,000 years ago, humans today have global and regional institutional systems that create bodies of laws and regulations that govern our lives, and they run on institutional firmware that we can adapt and change much more quickly than our evolutionary firmware. At least in theory, that affords us the potential to adapt and implement meaningful changes. Unfortunately, as of today, those systems all exist within the capitalist economic framework, which is the living embodiment of our unchecked infinite growth paradigm, ultimately punishing any system or institution that limits growth. Two, genetic re, 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 resequencing. This is really going to, you know, I, I, I could hear this already, the conspiracy wackos. Genetic resequencing. I, at first I thought he was going to talk about uh, genetically modifying us down to the size of like fleas, for instance. Maybe if we were the size of fleas, that that would, uh, you know, honey, I, I shrunk the humans. Uh, it, anyway, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. All right, what is genetic resequencing? It is not completely unthinkable that at some point in the future, we will have the technology and knowledge to rewrite our evolutionary firmware, forcing a revolutionary 
rather than evolutionary adaptation to life as a species with access to unlimited energy. This could have unimaginable, unintended consequences, maybe worse than anything we have done so far. Yes, but if the vestiges of humanity entering the 22nd century are to survive as a high technology civilization, they will have to learn how to wield energy in a sustainable way because the only way I know to survive the entropy of a collapsing system is to throw unimaginable amounts of energy at it. Now, uh, I am not going to get in a friendly debate with Ruben. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm more with his sentence. This could have unimaginable, unintended consequences, maybe worse than anything we have done so far. Uh, and, and leave it at there, but it is an interesting thought. Okay, moving forward. Then again, maybe what's really needed is a new perspective on our purpose and existence. Maybe any highly intelligent life form that suddenly gains access to unlimited energy and resources is doomed to self-destruct. It's not at all clear that intelligence on its own is a good long-term survival trait for animals to have. Looking at living fossils, think turtles, crocodiles, coelacanths, they are all pretty basic. Humanity might just have a hard sell-by date baked into their story. I like to think that in exchange for that, we get art and music and science. We get to reach for the stars and send physical mementos of our existence even beyond our solar system. When you talked about how meaningful music and art is to you, that really resonated. It was, with, it was with the beginning of the pandemic that I had a realization. Watching movies and TV series is not a waste of time, if done consciously and intentionally. It can be a celebration and appreciation of human creativity and our ability to self-reflect. Calling the creation and consumption of art a frivolous pursuit seems like a cynical rejection of the immutable bargain nature has struck with us. With all of that said, we truly live in the Chinese curse of interesting times, and your generation has a unique perspective on it. Your life began during the most prosperous period of human history, and some of you will live long enough to witness well past the beginning of humanity's most tragic and sad chapter to date. I am honestly at a loss about how to prepare and raise my children in the face of the changes ahead, and the mother of my children is completely and utterly invested in the charade of business as usual, calming her mind by recycling batteries and using the eco setting on the dishwasher. I don't really know what to do about my own future either. 
it feels so difficult to predict what set of skills, what kind of resource and time investments will actually be most useful for the time ahead. I am currently working on product as a product developer. It's not quite a career yet, and as a side effect, I've been building up micro-scale manufacturing capability in my own home, 3D printing, CNC milling, whatever that is, PCB manufacturing. I am thinking about what I can contribute within a cooperative technological society that is facing severe disruptions in the global supply chain and industrial capacity. I want to be able to help fix, maintain, and extend vital technologies and infrastructure within my community to lessen the suffering and hardship for those around me. That is the best thing I can come up with right now. I'm sorry if this was a bit much to read. I think about this stuff all the time, but cannot really have this kind of discourse with anyone around me, and the only other people I know that share some of my observations often turn out to be conspiracy nut jobs. I try to be kind to and appreciate people for exactly who they are, but it feels like I'm living on a separate planet with my thoughts. It is a profoundly lonely existence. The only times I feel connected to the rest of the world is when I immerse myself in art and music and when I spend quality time with my kids. Take care, Ruben. There you go. Uh, that was quite the mouthful. Obviously, I do not agree with 100% of what Ruben said, but it is certainly uh, a well-spoken and well-thought-out perspective on uh, being a, I, I guess, a young adult uh, father here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up because uh, I want to go, now that I'm fine, now that Ruben has uh, relieved some of my guilt about immersing myself into mindless uh, TV shows, I'm going to go head back over to Netflix and continue watching The Watcher. Get out there and uh, relieve your guilt in this lonely existence. However, you still can. Bye, guys.